Well, it's an amazing day here in Washington, D.C. We're sitting on top of the double-decker bus that's wrapped in uh, GW basketball. We've got Jamie and Christian, our first year head coach of the men's basketball team, and Jen Rizzotti, who's starting her fourth year here. Um, this is our first episode of TV Time. So thanks for joining me, guys. Yeah, our pleasure. Awesome. Great to be here. The wind is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, cool. You know, we have a hashtag at GW that says only at GW. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not just a hashtag. So I'd love to have a conversation about what only at GW means to you and how you see that in action. Sure. You want to go first? You sure. Guys? Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think when you talk about being only at GW, it, it's about the people that these guys get a chance to be in the class with every single day. Um, it's just so unique what their dreams are, what their hopes are, what their wishes are, the purpose of why they're here. Um, it's just everyone's here to achieve excellence, and, and that's really special. And so when we say only at GW, to me it means so much about the people that you're with yeah. and that they're, what their focus is. Yeah, and I, I agree completely. I also think it's about location. And as we drive around this awesome bus and we're making our way down here to the Lincoln Memorial, I think about how I can walk out of the office and go for a three-mile jog and decide if I want to go see the Jefferson Memorial or the Washington Monument. And, we can bring our teams down to do workouts on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, and there's not really anywhere else in the country that you can do that. Only at GW, right? Only at GW. <laughs> so um, you guys both have played, had the opportunity to play for some um, Hall of Fame coaches, and I'd love to hear a little bit about how those coaches shaped your lives and formed your own leadership style. Sure. I mean, I, I, I'll go first because I played for the best. I'm taking dibs here. <laughs> um, you know, I had a great opportunity to learn a lot before I ever even thought that I wanted to be a coach or knew that I wanted to be a coach. Um, I got to play for Gino at UConn and, and learn a lot about how to build a program um, the right way, but also how to sustain it, which I think in our business is probably the hardest thing to do. And I was fortunate to have a, a great college career, a great pro career, and be able to be influenced by a lot of different coaches. And I learned about what I wanted to do uh, in my own way. I, I learned a lot about what I didn't want to do as a coach, um, but I think being a player before I coach has a lot to do with me um, being, just being able to impact my players because I've been in their roles. I've, I've, sat, I've been in their shoes. I've sat in their seat. I know what it's like to be a college student athlete and the pressures that go along with it. So I think uh, as much as those coaches helped me become a great player and, and, and shape my coaching future, I think the fact that I, I sat in those um, seats, I can really impact my players in a, in a special way. Yeah. yeah, I played for Jim Phelan, head coach of Mount St. Mary's for 49 years. Um, you know, Coach Phelan, number one, he coached through so many different ages of basketball. Um, whether it was fast or slow or three-point line or no three-point line, he really coached and won in every one of those different ages, which I thought was pretty unique. Um, you know, the way he really handled us as a team, um, all about us being unselfish. He, didn't, he treated us way more than just basketball players, which I really appreciated. You know, we would get to the springtime and he would talk to us a ton about other things that we wanted to do. He just would connect with us on a lot of different levels. And, you know, I feel like now everyone's just so caught up in just only hoops. Yeah. And I think he just always gave us great perspective. He was a family man, loves his wife and his kids. And you could really see that in how he, how he, how he ran his program with how he was with us. Yeah. So I take those kind of things away that you can win yep. in a lot of different ways, but winning with a caring heart is really special. Yeah, I think the people forget that. There's X's and O's means so little. The relationship piece means a lot. So if you played for a coach that really understood how important that was, then it, I think, automatically gives you a head start in your own coaching career. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at that bond that you're able to have, I mean, you're a point guard, I was a point guard. Yeah. That bond you have with your head coach, yeah. it's almost like you're, you know, you're sharing the same struggles together on a day-to-day -day basis. So I always feel like, you know, when, the, when we're in a tough point in the season, I've kind of been there before, yep. and I can look into our best players' eyes and their hearts and really know what they're going through. Yeah. You bring up a really cool point that I, I don't think I realized. Like, you guys are both point guards. Um, <laughs> how, how does that shape how you, how you look at the game and how you coach? Well, it definitely makes uh, our point guards have the hardest <laughs> job. <laughs> and I always tell my prospective student athletes that if you want to come and play for me as a point guard, I promise you it won't be easy. Um, but no, I think that it's a natural leadership position as a player. You're, you're always considered to be an extension of your coach on the floor. Um, 
you need to have the biggest voice. You need to understand where everybody's supposed to be. So you're like a coach in training. I, I seriously believe that that's why there's so many point guards that go into coaching is because we have to think the game um, for everybody on the team, offensively, defensively. And we have to know what our coaches are thinking before they even say it. Because when we go into that huddle, um, the four other people looking at you, they, they expect you to be giving them the message that the coach gives you when they call a timeout in a huddle. So. It's like you're a coach before you even become a coach. Yeah, and I think learning how to accept responsibility for what happens on yes. the floor. Yep. You know, I meet so many coaches that don't want to accept responsibility for what happens on the floor. And as a point guard, everything is your bad. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, and just learning, you know, how to really get the most out of every player that you're with. Because yeah. whether you're passing the ball to a freshman center or, or senior center, they're different in their way to catch the ball. And so you have to figure out the different ways to make them be at their very best. Yeah. And you have to really think outside of yourself but yet still maintain that level of confidence. Like I know you probably show in practice sometimes, like, you know, you need to be able to take over the game exactly. and to have that kind of confidence exactly. in ourselves. It was one of my favorite moments when I first got here, my first season was um, telling Malin Batista <laughs> that no matter what happens, it's your fault. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if somebody goes to the wrong spot, takes the wrong shot, has the wrong matchup on defense, guess whose fault it is? And she just looked at me and I said, yours. And so that was kind of like our relationship right from the start. And I said that to the team, like, hey, you guys better listen to her because if you all mess up, she's the one getting yelled at. <laughs> um, and I think that that kind of relationship that we have with our point guards, that we as point guards have with our coaches, it kind of transcends everything else. And, and, and it gives you that, um, that philosophy that we were talking about earlier, um, that communication, that trust, that relationship, it really builds um, a lot about you know, how you, what you stand for and what your culture is. I love it. Let's keep talking about leadership. So um, we talked about the fact that you, um, you, you both played for Hall of Fame coaches, that you both are point guards. What else has shaped um, how you think about leadership, whether it's books that you've read or um, podcasts that you listen to? What's shaped um, how you've developed your leadership? Well, you know, I would say there's a lot of things. I think at different points in your life, you're looking towards different different aspects that can really benefit you. You know, I've kind of put myself into this routine where I'm constantly in this leadership mode, where I'm constantly listening to different podcasts. You know, Michael Gervais has a great podcast I love listening to. Um, Tim Not Kite has a great podcast I love listening to. So we kind of move those around. Um, but I think most importantly, like, you know, like books good to great, or yeah. excellent to read, five dysfunctions of a team, like digging in on different, different kinds of books outside of basketball to just learn how different leadership is, is viewed. And, because the reality of it is every player that comes to our program is different. Yeah. So we need to be able to create something that gives us a great guideline for leadership, but in the same respects, still gives us the ability to have flexibility to coach others in different ways. Yeah. And I think just having a growth mindset. I mean, Jamie and talked about, you know, books and podcasts that don't always necessarily have to do with sports. Yeah. I mean, leadership is leadership. And if you're always going into a scenario, whether you're, you know, speaking at a conference or you're listening at a coach's clinic or you're going to the Final Four and attending the convention, uh, if you always have this mindset that there's something to learn from other people, um, I think that makes you a better leader. The, min the day you stop thinking you have more to, more to learn is the day you're in trouble. And I, I learn a lot from my own players. I don't think my leadership style necessarily changes a lot foundationally, but I certainly work really hard to understand the best way to lead every individual player, and I think that's important. Uh, I think every coach that I played for, uh, even the coaches that I'm around now, um, between attending other college practices or being a part of USA Basketball, um, there's something I can learn from every every single person I've ever listened to. And uh, I try to always remember, we said this earlier, there's more than one way to do things successfully. So if I need to be flexible and change my mindset to be a better leader, then uh, with this generation of, of kids that are coming up, um, then I'm gonna do that. Um, because I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, you want to do what's best for your team and you want to do what's going to help your team be the most successful on and off the floor. Uh, so if you're, not, if you're not willing to be flexible, it's hard to ask your own, your own players to be flexible. Yeah, I think what's neat here at GW, we have so many coaches and colleagues yes, yeah. that are excellent leaders. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can be inspired to be a better leader every single day with the people you have a chance to have a conversation with, yeah. you know, like whether it's going to lunch with Jen or Margie and, you know, they just give you so many good nuggets that things that maybe you haven't thought of or things that they, they know a little bit deeper than you do. Yeah. And I think when you're, when you're a person who loves to learn, you're in a great environment to be, a, be amongst the elite. And when you're amongst the elite, if you're in the right place, you're going to continue to learn. And grow. Yeah, I love that. I think about um, the conversations that we all have um, about 
organizations and about culture. Um, culture became a little bit of a buzzword over the last couple of years. I, I saw um, a pretty funny video of press conferences of men's basketball coaches and it was like culture, culture, culture. But we, we, we all value it, yeah. right? And we're yeah. working on it at the university level um, with the work that we're doing with the Disney Institute. Obviously we're working on it with the athletics department, but I would love to hear from you guys as you think about that word culture, how you bring it to life, how you form that in your own programs, um, kind of what place does culture have in, in your respective programs? You know, we, we kind of rephrase it. We call it our, our way of life um, because the reality of it is like we're, we have to live a certain way to be excellent, to be elite. Um, and so I want the guys to always understand that it's not a phase that you're in, it's a way of life. So every single day you're signing up to be elite, every single day and everything you're doing, you're trying to be at your very best. So we talk about that first and foremost, just, you know, when you wake up in the morning, what are you doing? Are you making your bed up when you wake up in the morning? You know, are you getting, are you getting going? Are you in this routine to be excellent every single day, to put yourself in the right mindset? So we start really with talking to them about their routine. Um, and then we kind of move on just about what their dreams are, the things that they really want. Um, because their way of life is gonna be shaped by what, what motivates them. And everyone in that locker room has a little bit different thing that motivates them. So trying to keep, continue to keep that as part of it as we're working on this team goal, I think is very important. Um, but I think the constant communication that we have for them, the way that we love our guys every day, we love them differently. We love them, we, we, we love them and hold them accountable to everything they want to do. I think that's a part of the way we establish our way of life. Um, the way we're able to just interact, the way we want to interact with people on campus and making that a focal point of everything we're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, it helps us gain the first level that you need to establish the right kind of culture. Yeah. Yeah, I think everybody wants to talk about culture, but I'm not sure everybody wants to actually put the work in to create the right one. And I'm not sure that there's a, a blueprint to how to do it perfectly. I think it it's, it's kind of has to be organically created. And, and when, when I think about what you're saying, the words that stand out to me is communication, relationships. We go back to relationships again. And then having consistent values. Um, you can say you want a great culture, but if you don't recruit the right kind of people, to fit your culture, you're not gonna have it. It doesn't matter how hard you, how many team bonding sessions you do, you have to, as a coach, uh, truly understand what's important to you in terms of values. And then you have to be very consistent about communicating those values and bringing the right people in there because you're not, we're not really gonna change them very much once they step on campus, a little bit. And if you're surrounded by the right people, certainly we can broaden their horizons. But a lot of kids are who they are. So you wanna make sure you're bringing good people in that come from good families that value the things that you value, whether it's unselfishness on the basketball floor or giving back to the community off the court or making academics a priority. Um, and then for me, it's trust and communication and building those relationships. I need to have kids that value those things for me to be successful as a coach and for me to feel like my culture is where I need it to be for us to be really, really good. Yeah, I agree. I think what's really neat about it, I don't know about you, Coach, I feel like it comes down to like defending the things that are yes. not gonna yes. not gonna lead you to be elite. Yes. It's much more about that accountability level. Yeah. You know, like when you're the point guard and you're telling people to run the floor, yeah. it's like every day you're constantly telling people yeah. what their habits are that aren't leading them towards a level of account the level of excellence that you want yeah. to have the best way of life. Yeah, it's funny. My my second year, I remember uh, meeting with our captains about two thirds of the way through the year, and um, after I met with them about a few things that they felt good about, and then a couple things they didn't feel good about, I remember going back to my staff and saying. We did it, like we, we got our guys to defend our culture. Like we don't need to go in the locker room and tell them what our culture is. They're coming to me saying, this guy isn't doing what she needs to be doing. And it's like, I don't even need to address it because they're defending what we talked about wanting to have. And so to then be able a month later to go and win a championship and play in the NCAA tournament as a coach, it's like, yeah, the, the winning feels successful, but I think for me, knowing that our players bought into what we really want to be all about, that felt more like a win to me than anything else. I love that. When you get people in your organization to, to truly defend um, what's important, I mean, that's when, when I think a culture or an organization really comes to life. You know, we talk about being this visible display of discipline and excellence for the university. I'd love to hear, you know, we've, we've used words like elite, we've used words, um, we've talked about building sustainable cultures. When you think about building your program for excellence, what does that entail? Well, I, I think it starts with love. Um, you know, love is, is so important. You know, you want to be around people who love what you're doing every day. Yeah. 
you know, when, when, you, when, you're, when you're in a relationship with people that love you, they just build you up constantly and you build them up constantly and it's so organic that it doesn't feel like a chore. You know, when what we're doing becomes truly like love and truly like play, um, you, know, you just, you just give, you, opens a door to be able to reach such a higher level. Um, and so I think it always, everything really starts there for us. And when you're talking about in the recruiting process, it's like, would I love to coach this person or not? Yeah. You know, and if I can bring in a team of people that I want to, that I would love to coach, then we're going to be in a pretty good place. And, you know, I think we start there with love. And, you know, Coach, I know you, you're probably pretty dip, yeah. in depth with this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously I think excellence goes hand in hand with what you think success is. And so you have to know what your definition of success is. And as coaches and as athletes and as people involved in sports, um, it's, it's tricky to not think that that just means wins. Sure. And obviously we want to win and we were competitive, you know that, and that's what we're here for. But at the end of the day, how we win and how we're excellent means a lot more to me than anything else. And I, if a, if a fan comes to my game for the first time and watches my team play, regardless of whether we win and lose, and they're, they're not proud of what they see on the floor and how my kids competed and the sports and shit that they displayed, uh, how good of teammates they were to each other, how competitive they were. Um, the, the final score doesn't matter so much if they walk out, out of the building and they saw a team that represents who I am uh, and, and vice versa. The, the same thing goes for if we win and we don't win the right way, I'm not going to feel good about my team. So I think a display of excellence is about how you hold yourself, how you compete, um, how you walk around campus, how you treat people, um, and how you treat each other. And when we come in the locker room every day and we're ready to get together, uh, wanting to go up upstairs and get better, um, and want to do it for each other, want to play for me, want to play for each other, I want to play for the university. I think that's the kind of display of excellence that we're working towards every day. Yeah, I always tell our team, you know, anytime we step on the floor together, we want to we want to inspire anyone that's watching us, right? I mean, you know, there's someone sitting up in the highest section that had an awful day, yep. that paid money to come watch you play. Inspire them to have a better day tomorrow. Yeah. Inspire them to come back to a game. Inspire them to be kind of to the person beside them. And I think. Sports gives you a platform where when you watch a team out there that's really connected, you have the ability to really inspire others. And so we use the word to inspire yeah. when people come to watch us. I love that. Yep. You know, at GW, we have a common purpose, right? And it goes like this. Only at GW, we change the world one life at a time. When you hear that statement, what, is it, what does it mean to you? How does it resonate with you? I, I think for me, it, I think a lot about what we're doing beyond the four lines of our basketball floor. Um, I, I know when I talk to uh, people around the program that don't really know us, I'm always so proud when I'm able to describe the, the opportunities that our kids have outside of basketball. You know, whether it's life skills development and leadership development and career service and uh, mentorship opportunities within the athletic department and then all of these academic opportunities, internship opportunities, the networking of, of alums um, around the country and around the world that our kids have. And, and so if we're gonna spend that much time and put, invest that much in each one of them to make that much of a difference, it's, it's what we're gonna expect of them when they leave. Yeah. And so you know, send, setting a foundation for who they become uh, once they walk out the door. And I think when we, again, you talk about excellence and you talk about success, it's not just about how many wins they have while they're here, it's about all the wins that they're gonna have when they leave and all the, all the impact that they're gonna have on people's lives because they attended GW and because they were a part of our program. Yeah, and I feel like everyone at our university has such a large task at hand because yeah. of how political our students are. Sure. You know, we're, we're, really, we're really helping to create the, the leaders of tomorrow and the leaders that are gonna make decisions that are gonna impact the world. Yeah. And I just feel like that's such a large obligation to make sure that on a day-to-day -day basis, we're not only educating them on the floor, yeah. but we're really educating them about the entire world and the scope that we're in, and hoping that we can use our locker room as a way to help them understand different people from different backgrounds, yeah. and to have a, connect, a connectivity amongst them where they're gonna be able to speak, educa speak, speak educationally about it. And yeah. I think that's gonna be really important as we move forward with, with what we're doing here at GW. Yeah. And using their platform as a student athlete, you know, to be able to talk about what's important to them in the right way, in an educated way, um, and in a way that's sensitive to the fact that other people have a different viewpoint. I think that when you create an environment where they feel safe and they feel like uh, they're not being judged, 
um, so they can express how they feel and they respect each other's difference of opinions. Um, then you're sending them out into the world a little bit more prepared than maybe when they arrived. I love that. You know, only at GW, one of the things I love about that is that DC brings people from all yes. walks of life yes. together. Um, so we've been, um, I don't know, maybe a half hour or so um, going around our favorite city. And I think about, uh, there's a spot, um, I think we we're on 17th Street where you're in between um, the, the uh, Washington Monument and the World War II Memorial and, and you have a view of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, this city always leaves me at awe, right? Like in yeah. awe. So I'd love to hear from you guys, what's some of your favorite places or maybe your favorite monument or memorial? Um, wh which one resonates with you? Um, well, I, I mean, it's gonna seem simple. I, I love standing on the spot where Martin Luther King gave his speech. Yeah. Um, I, I love standing, I like to go there when I have some time and I need to think a little bit. You know, it's really hard to, to stand on those, on those steps in the place where he gave his, I have a dream speech and not feel inspired to do more sure. and to not feel like you can accomplish anything. Because really the, what he was speaking about on that day and where we are now, we're making so much progress and it's just so much about like being a visionary enough and being daring enough and courageous enough to step out and say some things that people may may not agree with at the time yeah. but are right generationally. Um, so that's one of my favorite spots. Yeah, it's powerful, no question. Yeah, I think about like when my family comes to visit, like where do I take them? You know, like what's yeah. the where, what's yeah. the route? You know, we always go to Lincoln Memorial because I think it's like what people see the most. Yeah. Uh, and then we always go to Martin Luther King Memorial because of the location of it, the the meaning behind it, and then I love that it's on the on the basin there. But I think for me personally, my favorite is the Jefferson Memorial. Yeah. And I love it because it's like a little bit offset. Yep. So not as many people go over there. Yeah. So it's a little less crowded. But when I take my runs and I have a little extra time, I, I try to go around the, the, the water there and, and stop just briefly on the, the, at the bottom of the memorial because I, um, I just like where it is. I just like what it means. And um, I feel like I can then loop back around and <clears throat> If you're ever walking through at night, I think the World War II Monument uh, Memorial is the best with the, with the fountain and the lights. But if I'm going to kind of go out of my way, it's definitely going to be uh, over there at the Jefferson Memorial. Yeah, that's awesome. The city at night, too, yes. is spectacular. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I have to ask this. Why, um, why did you guys pick GW? Yeah, I've, always, yeah. I've always wanted to be here. <laughs> Um, He's got a better story yeah, than me, you know, so always, go for it. I always go for wanted it. to be here. Um, you know, I mean, people know my story about being from a small country town and watching Mike Jarvis's teams be dominant on TV. And, yeah. you know, so my story is a little bit unique. Um, you know, I always wanted to be in a place where I felt like my values could really show out. And I feel like here at GW, we have that platform to be able to do that, to be able to recruit the kind of student athletes that I believe can lead you to be a dominant team in college basketball. Um, GW lends you all those different opportunities just with just with the city and with the people that want to come here and the people that attracts um, but I just always always knew you could really achieve greatness here and I've always been chasing after greatness and, and I'm just so happy to be here yeah. well I, I would say there's, there's so many reasons that attracted me um, to GW and I, I remember in my third season of coaching I was only 28 at the time um, I kind of figured out that like if you wanted to be good you had to play you had to play a good schedule yeah. you know like I didn't really know a lot about coaching I could put in offense and you know coach them up on defense but once I started to learn about the ins and outs of college basketball it was about we need to play a hard schedule if we want to be ready for conference play and so we scheduled a trip to come down here and play Mason and GW and the same I think it was like Friday Saturday so it was like back to back so it was very ambitious and we lost both but that year, my team ended up going on to win my first ever um, America East championship and go to my first NCAA tournament. And I always credit that trip because it was like the moment where I realized that I didn't matter what my record was. It mattered that I was preparing my team for greatness. And I came back twice after that to play in GW's tournament once over Thanksgiving. And then the year before I came here, we came down and played them when John Quell was here and they were making their big run. And so it was always a special place for me because Sally and I used to always go for runs around the monuments and we always thought it was such a unique setting. I always loved the Atlantic 10 and what the conference stood for and the competitiveness of it and the fact that it was a basketball conference. I love the footprint of where the A-10 is located, the fact that we'll still play up in you know, my home area and we're gonna play really competitive teams 
um, all along the East Coast. Uh, and then I love the academic um, prestige that the, the university's names comes with. And the fact that we could attract um, really, really high level basketball players as well as high level academic kids uh, was, was, was a big pull for me in this direction. And, and Tanya, I'm not gonna lie, um, you, were, you, were, you were part of that decision too. And I, I think for me to be able to work for people who valued what I brought to the table and understood that I was more than just a basketball coach, um, that understood all the other things that I could bring to the table as a leader of your young women. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I worked for a boss that uh, valued what I could bring every single day. And I think uh, your, you know, your pitch to me and um, what you saw for the program and the vision that you had was certainly a, a big reason why I wanted to be here too. Yeah, yeah I think that's so unique, having, having a person that you work with yeah. that wants you to be more than just yeah. the coach that wants you to lead in the right way and has, you know, has integrity with the way we want you to lead. I think that's so important. And, you know, obviously I felt the same way with Tanya when we we're going through that process. I just really love the fact that she'd been a coach before. Yeah. So she understood it. You know, we don't get that opportunity very much anymore. Um, so she understood it. She under knew, understood what growth was. She really understood GW yes. and what, what the players needed in that locker room. Yeah. But I just love the fact that she wanted to do it the right way. Yeah. And she understands what that's going to take. Cool. Um, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about, but you mentioned, you know, running with with Sully. Um, what does DC and what does GW mean for your family? Well, for my family, it means my, my son's about two hours away, so <laughs> I get a chance to see him often, and yeah. um, got to watch him hit a double and a single last week, which is a highlight of yeah. of, of his week. Um, you know, my family, my wife has works down here. She's worked down here for a couple of years, so you know, it's great for our family. It's great for them to be able to come to games and be a part of it every single day. Um, and to be a part of the, being a part of a historic city, yeah. you know, they're, we're going to grow up different. My family will grow up differently than how I grew up, um, and understand the world a little bit better. And I'm just excited for the opportunity for them. Yeah, yeah. I my kids. I think my kids have been really lucky to be around a lot of diversity because of sports. Um, but there's no more diversity than DC, and so um, for them to, like you said, be able to come to work, to be able to see where we, where we do our job and the impact that we're having on on other people's lives. Um, you know, the excitement of the city, the, the history of the city. Sully's a big history buff, so you know we get a history lesson every time we come down here. Um, but also for their, them to expand their horizons. I think that you want that for your children. You want that for yourself. You want to go, you want to push yourself outside your comfort zone and outside of the limits that maybe you had. And so every generation, whether it's my parents made my life better than theirs was, it's what I want for my kids. I want their, their life to be bigger and better than, than mine. And so I think you want to be in a place where that kind of thing can happen at a, at a, a greater level. And, and there's no better place than Washington, D.C. I love it. Well, we, um, we've come back into Foggy Bottom, and I, I can't thank you both enough. Um, when I think about our common purpose and the thing that we're doing every day, you guys are changing the world one life at a time. And uh, I just want to thank you for being our guest today on TV Time. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to be able to top that podcast anymore, you know? And it's like the best one, right, Jamie? <laughs> the first one is always yeah, the best one. Yeah, we set the bar pretty high. Yeah, no question about that. <laughs> I appreciate you both. Thanks for having us. All right, raise high. <laughs>